We present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jump. And welcome to the News Quiz, which this week, to coincide with the BBC Six Music Festival, comes from the Trinity Centre in Bristol. We start this week's programme with a cutting from the Church Times, read by Zeb Soames. The Vicar of St David's and St Michael's and All Angels, Exeter, has installed locked iron gates at the entrance of the church to stop couples having sex on the steps. Installing the gates will protect the church from the antisocial behaviour which the opening was being used for. <laughs> Our thanks to Andrew Sims in Cardiff for panning for that filth. Uh, now let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first, on my right, Jeremy Hardy and Justin Morehouse. <laughs> and opposite them, on my left, six music DJ Steve Lamack and Susan Kalman. So, Jeremy, whose position is now an imposition? Well, this is... Uh, the, the Hunt has imposed... Jeremy Hunt has imposed this contract on the junior doctors, who, let's face it, are the most wildcat bunch of militants. <laughs> it's like the bad old days of the car industry in, in, in the 60s. They're out all the time, the doctors. They were out in 2012, in 1975, I think. <laughs> They're just hardly at work. They're on strike all the time. And Jeremy Hunt has the nerve to go on telly with his little NHS lapel badge. At least Thatcher didn't wear a miner's helmet in the 80s. <laughs> um, um, he's, you know, just listen to the doctors. You're not going to win, win public sympathy over by taking on the people who look after us. But he's determined to humiliate our doctors. Yeah, and he's very fit and healthy, though, isn't he? He's looking after himself. He's always running. He's always, you see him running. You can run, boy. Yeah, you run, Jess. <laughs> Run, boy, you run as fast as you can, because one day you'll fall, your knees will go, you'll go arse over tip, and you'll wake up in a recovery room wondering why all your pubic hair had to be removed <laughs> for a simple case of concussion. <laughs> yeah, it's the doctors and yeah. Hunt. My, uh, my favourite thing that came out of this entire situation is there was a letter in the Telegraph from Dr Markham... Parslow, which I think summed up how we all feel. It's about the seven-day NHS, obviously, which is what Jeremy Hunt wants. And he wrote, uh, On Friday, I rang the constituency office of Jeremy Hunt for a surgery appointment. The receptionist says, There none were available for a month. I asked if there were any weekend surgeries, but was told he only does Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... Uh, I th the sad thing is, these are educated people that obviously want to help people and they've gone through college and they put themselves through that, they want to help people, and they're being driven to this action now. And they, they, They've gone for it as well. They've written placards and everything with their demands, but... We don't know what they are, because the writing is terrible. And, uh... <laughs> but I, I want to know what doctors do when they go on strike, because I, I remember a few years ago when the firemen went on strike, and I thought they, they ladled the irony on as they stood around lighting fires. <laughs> <laughs> just stood around their brazier. What do the doctors well, do when they go on strike? They punch somebody and just refuse to treat them. <laughs> I walked past a group of uh, striking doctors uh, in London, and they had signs, they had placards they'd made themselves. It was like they'd have a craft afternoon. It was very beautiful. <laughs> and it said, honk if you support the junior doctors. And I, I don't have a car in London. Um, and I felt bad just going, honk. <laughs> so instead, I, I started hugging them. How, and then how many of them did you get through? I got through six. Six junior doctors, because I'm quite a rapid hugger. No. <laughs> and were they close enough to diagnose any of your symptoms? Yes. <laughs> One of them said, oh, you're awfully short. So... <laughs> Well See, they're not idiots, these people. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, the doctors is, it's not... All these doctors are basically trying to stand up for the NHS because they, they see it being privatised. Because it's, all the problems in the NHS are to do with people trying to run it like a business, like outsourcing everything. I, I went to get some blood tests, and it used to be the practice nurse used to do the bloods, and she was there all day, she's there anyway, and she would do all the bloods. And now I go to the sort of out-of-hours drop-in centre where you can go any time you like... And there's four blokes in tabards, so not the NHS, doing the bloods. One taking the blood, three just standing around getting paid. All got tabards. I don't know who these people are. I'm a G4S or something. <laughs> and they're taking my blood. They might own a black pudding factory for all I know. <laughs> 
things wrong with the NHS, and the number one thing wrong with the NHS is simply this. Do we have people in who work for the NHS that will be? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Thing, you know what's wrong with the NHS. It's everyone that works with it. What? It's undervalued. Yeah. You see what that is? That's an NHS joke. You had to wait a little bit longer than you thought. <laughs> but eventually you got what you needed and it was all right. No, the main problem with the NHS is all the sick people cluttering up. If you outsourced the allocation of beds to healthier people, you'd have far less problems in it. <laughs> The problem with the NHS is it's too successful. It's a victim of its own success. You go to the doctor's surgery tomorrow, you sit there and you look around the GP surgery, it's packed with people and there is nothing wrong with them. They're just old. <laughs> I genuinely see the... I'm not having to go at old people. It's not their fault they've survived. <laughs> Far from it. Yeah. But I sit there and I see this 89-year-old woman, Jean. Would Jean come to room two and she gets out of that chair in instalments and she's on her way to room two and she's like... It's like you can't Jurassic Park your way in and Uptown Funk your way out. What? You're not going to get... There's no elixir, Jean. Just give it a rest, Jean. So, <laughs> plug in the system up. We put Countdown on for you. <laughs> Home's in the country. What are you doing? Anyway. Justin, may I say, you have a wonderful bedside manner. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you had to uh, make any use of NHS services recently? Uh, Steve? I've... Um, the last time I... <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? <laughs> I, I was just... Am I looking peaky? No. <laughs> You I do just... live exclusively on fags and cider, Steve. <laughs> you forget the curry. <laughs> Steve, you don't need to disclose anything you don't want to disclose in the news, because this isn't part of the kind of hazing ritual. <laughs> the first time you come, you come on the news, because you have to you know, disclose any personal medical details. If you wanted to, however, just please say them, because I'm quite interested. What's the last thing that was wrong with you, Steve? Tell me. <laughs> Do you know, I haven't, been, I haven't been to a doctor's for ages. The last time, um, I had a bit of a tightening in my chest, and I thought, yeah, maybe I should just, uh, <laughs> maybe just see the local doctor. And I phoned up, and they said, uh, yeah, we've got an appointment. It will be in three weeks. And uh, so I said, it's fine. I'm sure I'll be fine. And it turned out I was fine. <laughs> it was just uh, two and a half weeks ago that happened. <laughs> mm, just to see how it turns out. Um, Non-consensually, this is about Jeremy Hunt, who has decided to impose a new contract on junior doctors after negotiations with the BMA broke down. Because that's what you do when negotiations fail. You just do whatever you were going to do in the first place. Um, <laughs> basically, if this was a siege, this is the point where Jeremy Hunt stops asking for a helicopter and starts shooting all of the hostages. <laughs> proving the old saying that one man's terrorist is another man's health secretary. <laughs> The BMA have suggested that further strikes could extend to emergency care, causing concern particularly to the elderly, the parents of young children and anyone taking part in the Channel 4 series, The Jump. <laughs> the strike caused widespread disruption. At least 2,884 non-urgent operations had been cancelled and Saturday's episode of Casualty was just Charlie Fairhead playing the Rizzler game with a cleaner. <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Uh, Justin, why might there be a red mist over the White Cliffs? Oh, this is, uh, this is... David Cameron this week has been accused of scaremongering, which is, uh, apart from iron and fish, is the only mongering that's left to us. Um, <laughs> he does a bit of warmongering as well, but we don't mention that one. There used to be costamongering, do you remember that? But they just do coffee now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, David Cameron has said, if we leave the EU with its open borders, then our borders might be more open. Yeah, that's the yes, idea. That that's the idea of it. He said that we've got this agreement now uh, with France that our border officials, which are the finest in the world, uh, <laughs> we will lose the control because our, our guys can go to France to stop people who might want to come here and seek asylum. Uh, if we leave Europe, that might not happen, even though that's not really an EU agreement. It's a sovereign uh, agreement between two sovereign, separate sovereign nations. But the big thing is, and the big worry is, that the jungle, which is currently in Calais, uh, which is this temporary home, which is full of sadness and, and despair and everything else, might, shock, horror, move from Calais to Folkestone. So Kent will cease to be the Garden of England mm. and become the Jungle of England, which is a, an upgrade in many ways, isn't it? I've, uh, I've been to the refugee camps in Calais and Dunkirk and we'd be lucky to have such people. I tell you, you go there, the entrepreneurial skills of those people, they've built shops, they've built cafes, and when we need entrepreneurs in this country and all we've got is the bloke who turns vacuum cleaners into hand dryers and a grinning failed balloonist who thinks he can run anything just because he doesn't wear a tie. We could do... <laughs> I think what we should do, uh, genuinely, I think, what, what we as a nation should do, 
we should ask Europe if they want us or not. Because there's no more British trait than us going, well, if we're not wanted, then we're not staying. <laughs> I mean, the, the other thing with about all the groups who are uh, campaigning to leave Europe, and there are loads of them, none of them seem to be able to agree on anything. They've started bickering. It's got to the point that they're turning into that scene from Life of Brian, mm. where Brian's in the gladiatorial arena and goes up to John Cleese and says, are you the Judean People's Front? <laughs> Naff off, we're the People's Front of Judea. <laughs> Splitters. <laughs> That's what it's like. Uh, does anyone know who the mayor of Calais is? Monsieur the uh, mayor <laughs> de Calais. Very close. No, uh, Philippe Mignonnet, who uh, yes, who sounds absolutely delicious. Was <laughs> <laughs> he playing golf for Liverpool? <laughs> hard, hard to say. Um, Classically, this is the doom-laden warning of one-man argument for a Bolshevik uprising, David Cameron, who said this week that leaving the EU might mean the Calais refugee camp would cross the channel to Dover. And if you thought migrants looked miserable in Calais, just wait till they've tried the breakfast in the Dover Weatherspoons. <laughs> in fact, Cameron has been accused of resorting to fear-mongering by none other than straight-talking man of the people and public school-educated former commodities broker Nigel Farage. <laughs> Surely, when you're being accused of using fear tactics about immigrants by the leader of UKIP, you may have stumbled just one or two yards away from the centre ground. <laughs> Leave campaigners pointed out that the current border wasn't an EU agreement, it was a deal between Britain and France, two countries that have an unblemished record of honouring their undertakings to each other. <laughs> Ever since the famous, can we have a word with that Joan of Arc, we promise we won't burn her agreement of 1431. Two points to Justin. Steve, who is in primary position? Oh, this was the big political shock of the week, an opinion poll which turned out to be accurate. Uh, <laughs> it's the primaries, and the New Hampshire primaries, where Donald Trump won uh, for the Republicans, and uh, on the other side, a guy called Bernie Sanders trounced Hillary Clinton, and uh, the two of them winning has... Um, led to uh, commentators in America saying, well, this is a vote against establishment politics, that people are just sick and tired of what they've been given and they want an alternative, and here's the alternative. And you couldn't get more alternative than a billionaire and a man who hates billionaires. Because <laughs> Bernie Sanders is... Because he's an interesting character, isn't he? Because he's, uh, he's been an independent politician for years and years, the independent um, senator for Vermont. And, uh, but he's running for the Democrats, but he's very left of centre, so he's campaigning for uh, more equality of pay, uh, universal health care, I think. He's come in on a sort of anti-austerity tip, which um, has also uh, led to one or two people saying, well, he's the American version of Jeremy Corbyn. And do you know uh, what, his, what his brother is called? Larry. He's a green, green. councillor in Oxford or That's something? That's right. Yeah. He's very sweet. He's being interviewed, the brother, and he's saying, I'm very proud of my brother Bernard. I think, oh, he still uses his full name because he's his brother. <laughs> So how does, he, how does he define himself politically, Sanders? What does he call himself? Socialist. He does. He does. Which, which in America, America is a big thing. Which in America is essentially like saying, I'm going to take your house and give it to terrorists. I well, mean, it's kind of one of them, isn't it? Because mm. what they would... If, you, if in America you say, I think poor people should be allowed to go to hospital if they need to, people say, you're a socialist. So what he said is, I'm a socialist. And they've said, what's that? <laughs> so he's kind of wrong-footed them all. Yeah. But, I mean, there's, people are saying there's a lot of similarities between... Bernie Sanders and, and Jeremy Corbyn, and there are. I mean, they're both to the left of the party. They've both been around for a long time without necessarily being noticed, and they're both surprisingly good kissers. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I've, um... <laughs> that is true. But, um... <laughs> but it is exciting. It's exciting to finally see two elderly white men win a primary. There's just not... There is not enough older white straight men in power, just as there's not enough white straight men on comedy panel shows. There's just... <laughs> not enough of them. Geriatrically, this is the New Hampshire primary, which saw self-proclaimed Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders and endlessly self-proclaimed Donald Trump carried to victory by an electorate who not only want decisive political change, but want it in the form of two white male pensioners. <laughs> Sanders is enormously popular with young people looking for a new kind of politics. Although I have to say to any young people listening, and it's unlikely... <laughs> 
At some point you're going to realise that the world is never going to get any better, that it's one disappointment after another, and the whole thing has been designed in such a way as to make your inevitable death less of a wrench. Still, <laughs> at least it's easier to get hold of a good quality coffee these days, so uh, <laughs> swings and roundabouts. <laughs> Hillary Clinton is suffering particularly with young women voters, although her husband has pledged to address all of their concerns... <laughs> points to Steve. Susan, who has been a Thornbury in the side of Labour? This story concerns uh, Emily Thornbury, who's the Shadow Defence Secretary, and it concerns a meeting of the Parliamentary Labour Party. Now, before Jeremy Corbyn, I always imagined the Parliamentary Labour Party meetings to be quite staid affairs. Uh, recently, they seem to have perked up a little bit, because Emily Thornbury was talking about Trident, which is the defence uh, system. I'm not an expert, but it's about weapons. And <laughs> some of the Labour Party are for them, and some of them are against them, which are quite entrenched positions. I mean, I don't know who would win in a fight. I- I'd put a five on the people who agree with weapons. Um, <laughs> and it's quite a serious issue. The Trident costs about uh, 32 billion pounds, to put that into context. That's three new Star Wars films. And... <laughs> And what happened was she was shouted down because she said Trident was as outdated as uh, Spitfires and, and people said she was an embarrassment. Now, Trident is undoubtedly going to be the big issue, I think, for the Labour Party coming up. And I was discussing this with a very good friend of mine called Jeremy Hardy earlier on today. And it may surprise you, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't want to upset you, but Jeremy Hardy is against Trident. Now, I know that's a shock to a lot of you. I always thought you'd be right up for it, Jeremy, but you said to me, no, I prefer traditional weapons like guns. At that point... (laughs) At that point, I got out of the taxi and just walked to the venue this evening. Um, It's a big issue, and Emily Thornbury doesn't seem to have a huge amount of respect from some of the Labour Party about this debate. And what is happening, and this is just my view... The debate is coming across. What is happening in the debate is more important than the actual debate. I'm, I'm naive when it comes to global politics of warfare and all that sort of thing, but it seems to me the argument is quite simple. There are some people on one side of it who say we should have Trident because it's a deterrent, and on the other hand, there's, there's people like saying, well, it's actually not very nice to kill millions of people, so let's not have it at all. So why don't we just put those two together? Aren't submarines sort of like underwater... <laughs> Shall we just tell everybody we've got loads of them? (laughs) How would they ever know? We just go, we've finished trying now, we've got 200. There's one outside every single country, so you just watch out. We're there, but you don't know where we are. It's the equivalent of having a a Rottweiler sticker in the corner of your window. We should just basically, on the Union Jack, we should change it and just put a sticker at the bottom with a submarine just going, watch it, mate. Tommy Trident lives here, <laughs> and he's not at his dinner. <laughs> uh, does anyone know where Corbyn was during the uh, Parliamentary Labour Party meeting? Was he at a karaoke bar in Soho? He was not at a karaoke... He kar- should have been. <laughs> then maybe he would cheer up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Corbyn, he was not at the Parliamentary Labour Party meeting because he was manning a phone bank for Sadiq Khan's mayoral campaign. Uh, So basically he's taken on receptionist work. Um, (laughs) uh, Or did anyone uh, hear Emily Thornbury on the Today programme? Yeah. Yes. uh, Did anyone know what... How did she describe the people who had given her this up-to-the-minute underwater drone research? Uh, I can't remember. It was very early in the morning, the Today programme. Mm. I only listen to it when I can't sleep. (laughs) called them Young Turks. That was her... Uh, that was unfortunate. Her groovy <laughs> uh, And Andy Burnham, he also was on the Today programme. Do you know what he said? Oh, I did watch that <clears throat> one, but I was just transfixed by his eyelashes again. He's got, like, beautiful eyelashes. Like Bambi. That make me... <laughs> you know, they talk about someone and you just watch their eye. I just... I mean, I... <sighs> <laughs> I just watched it with a sound down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Andy, if you're listening. I just watch everything you see with a sound down and look at your lovely, lovely eyes. <laughs> you're right, though. He's just got these fluttery lashes, like, tout chiclat has done, you know, like mm. the... You know what I'm saying, don't you, Jeremy? You know. No. <laughs> like mascara. You know, he's got... He's got You'll be grateful oh, for those brows, because one of the first things that happens when you get older is your brows go a bit funny. So, you know, your brows get a lot Mine less... Mine are falling out. They're going white and curly and falling out. My brows, eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of me, oh, God, I tell you what. People say white hair's distinguished. You think, not in the groin area. It's not. <laughs> 
Penis looks like a badger these days. <laughs> He's got TB. <laughs> yeah, well, a wonderful journey for us all. Um, <laughs> Shatteringly, this is Shadow Defence Secretary Emily Thornbury, whose presentation to Labour on Trident was delivered with such spectacular ineptitude that the party immediately called for its renewal in the hope that a nuclear apocalypse would at least make the whole thing stop. <laughs> One of the things she was talking about was drones being able to attack Trident submarines underwater. Although, if you've got to the point where another country is bombing your nuclear submarines, maybe it's time to press the button. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm no military strategist. Something I have in common with Emily Thornbury. <laughs> Thornbury even tried to get down with the cool kids by saying, I've been out talking to these young Turks about drone warfare. Well, seeing as the Young Turks was a political reform movement in the early 20th century, favouring replacement of the absolute monarchy of the Ottoman Empire with the constitutional monarchy, I can completely understand where she was coming from. <laughs> Two points to Susan, and at the end of... Any bonus points? Uh, yeah, uh, Justin's NHS joke. OK. We, basically, the, the scores always are the same because everyone has a funny tendency to get the answers right in this question. <laughs> so yes. one of the important jobs of the newsreader is to award bonus points. Uh, Miles, can I just say something? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it about eyebrows my, my or My mother lashes? always listens to the news quiz and then texts me afterwards to tell me what she thought of my performance, which is always the text I look forward to most <laughs> during the week. And uh, she texted me, genuinely texted me on uh, Friday and said, I really enjoyed the show, Susan. But um, is there any method to the scoring? Because I can never work it out. Tell her it's completely straightforward and she's just not listening hard enough. <laughs> My other half all... went to watch Strictly Come Dancing being filmed. I imagine and... that's a very similar experience to this. <laughs> and, and, and they film the Saturday show and then they do the results show on the same night but they don't show it till the Sunday. And they say to people who are in the audience, don't tell anybody, don't spoil it. And my other half said, that's like you with a news quiz, isn't it? I went, really isn't. <laughs> Except for Jeremy's sequins, it's completely different. <laughs> uh, so there's one bonus point for... Jo OK. And at the end of round one, the scores are Jeremy and Justin have five and Steve and Susan have four. <laughs> We start round two with a cutting from the Wellin Hatfield Times. An excrement problem has been reported on the pathways leading up to Wellham Green. A spokesman for the council said, it has been reported to us and we have logged it for clearance. <laughs> Our thanks to Crispin Driver for sending us that little nugget. <laughs> Jeremy, have a listen to this. In hindering the aged. OK, well, help the aged um, merged with with somebody else like Emerson, Lake and Palmer or something <laughs> to become Age UK. But they've been making money by taking money off of companies and then telling old people that's the company that the old people should, should use, including E.ON, the power company, and their people are paying more than they should be paying, which is really nasty thing to do with old people. You know, they're, they're recommending Dignitas as the holiday of a lifetime. Um, <laughs> I mean, and the power companies, I mean, basically, fuel poverty is one of the major reasons why old people are leaving this earth before they should do. So to actually put them on a higher tariff than they can afford is, it's like the RSPCA recommending illegal dog fights as good exercise. I mean, it's just <laughs> really, really quite nasty. They're, but they are, this is what they're doing. They're, they're taking all this money and saying, but we're doing it to help the old because we're an old people's charity. But they're telling them things like the overpriced funerals, they're selling them... Yeah, old people are being ripped off, paying too much for stuff. It would help if we had a nationalised power industry who just set a lower tariff for older people, obviously. Shoehorn that one in, that will get cut. Um, <laughs> and we can't be seen to have opinions on the radio because the chart is up for renewal. <laughs> and the Telegraph might ring us up. Ooh, what would we do then? Um, <laughs> In the, interests, in the interests of balance, I should say that private enterprise is bracing and the old are a burden on society and should <laughs> die. Now, this uh, company uh, that they educate, they've been recommending a funeral company, uh, it charges a lot more significantly than its rivals. You know what they offer? The company offers guaranteed cremation, which I think is quite... <laughs> 
no, uh, no good of you asked to be buried, though, is it? Um, I think if you want... I mean, the thing is, funerals are really, really expensive, but one of the, the reasons funerals are so expensive is the buffet, which is a big mistake. <laughs> because, basically, every old person in a 30-mile radius gets wind that there's a free tea. <laughs> <laughs> a discussion with my better half uh, recently because we were making our wills and um, this is genuinely what's in my will I want to be cremated and I want to be put in an urn and I have to be put on the mantelpiece with a plaque on it that says I'm still watching you <laughs> and it's true because Are I you can said... have little eyes painted on the urn yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my dad who's here has said to us for the last 20 years that when he dies he wants to be cremated and put in a rocket and fired up like a firework, and everyone's gone, yeah, 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 that's never going to happen. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll just say, we keep telling him it's going to happen, but we'll probably just, I've decided we'll probably just leave him in the back of the car for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you come to go and get your screen watch, go, oh, Dad's there. Uh, oh, where should we go? Where, where are we now? We're by the park. Oh, he loved it here. <laughs> What about you, Steve? Are you, are you as needy in death I, as I just, I've, I'm, I'm amazed because I've, I've not made a will, but I've made a sort of... I've made a list. And a of playlist. A list of things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, and, and have gone round and asked these people. So come the uh, funeral, the only thing that I have sorted out is that Jim Bob from Carter, the Unstoppable Sex Machine, will come and play live... So I've got to go before him, uh, and he's going to come and play, come and play the impossible dream. I want so, so weeping. Stupid. Could you just sign this? I've just done a will for you. It just says <laughs> I give Susan everything. So if you just want to, my favourite funeral piece of music, and this comes up on the Six Music Show quite a lot. What you're going to have played at your funeral? But uh, a chap who's a journalist friend of uh, ours died, and we all went to the funeral. It was a very moving service, and uh, obviously the coffin moves off. And it was silent just for a second, and then... Ding, 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 ding. These boots are made for all... <laughs> yeah, I've decided, I've left strict instructions, I want to be scattered. Not cremated, just scattered. <laughs> I want to be left in carrier bags behind the lavatories of motorway service stations all over the country. <laughs> Do you know when you get a person back from, from the crematorium, it's, it's not the whole person because it's too much person? A person is loads and loads of ash. You only get a bit of it. The rest of it's on the plants. That's true. I think you get enough of them to get a sense of them. <laughs> Especially, this is the shocking news that Charity Age UK have been recommending to pensioners an Eon energy tariff that costs £249, more than Eon's cheapest rate. Although perhaps this is good news. Old people often claim they're discriminated against, so it's good that energy companies treat them with as much contempt as they treat the rest of us. <laughs> But I know that the news quiz has a lot of elderly fans, uh, particularly since the NHS made listening to this programme an official part of the Liverpool Care Pathway. <laughs> this sort of behaviour amounts to exploitation of the vulnerable, and if any of our elderly listeners would like to share any stories of injustice with us, please feel free to call in on our premium rate helpline. <laughs> Remember, you'll get an attractive carriage clock just for inquiring. <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Uh, Justin, why could the old bill become the old beak? Oh, this is a story. It's a great story. And if this happens, I will be excited. Uh, the story emerged this week that the Met may, and it's always one of those may, start using specially trained eagles in f crime fighting. <laughs> and it's to take out drones. Now, uh, drones are, the, the correct term is, it's a collective name for the non piloted aircraft. Criminals are using these drones by remote control to get drugs into prisons, to transport money across borders and all sorts of things, and they're going to train these eagles to take out the drones. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that this week was the week that Sir Bernard Hogan Howe uh, got an extension to his contract as the Met Chief, and I think this is just part of that. I think he was in the meeting and they went, right, you want your job to carry on? What are you going to give us? And he just panicked. <laughs> just looked out the window, saw a bird and went, Eagles! Crime fighting! <laughs> Crime fighting eagles! Uh, I've got bears that are going to catch joyriders. <laughs> that's it. Basically, that's it. There's an idea that has come from Holland uh, where Met officers went on a fact-finding mission. Of course they did. Um, <laughs> So they went to Amsterdam and they came back and said, we've got this great idea. Um, 
basically, we've got eagles <laughs> that are going to fly around and going to take out the drones. Um, and this is the idea mm. to stop the illegals with the eagles will be the catchphrase, <laughs> or uh, bring back the flying squad, or something like that. That's what's that's what's happening. The, the idea that if they are moving drugs, so it's like a, well, a home delivery service, the drone will deliver the drugs. So if you've got the drone and the drugs and the eagle, all I'm saying is that's the most thrilling remake of The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite like to have a sort of falcon that I could have at home that would come and tell me if the milk's about to boil over. <laughs> Wouldn't that be sensible? Does uh, anyone know how the police eagles will dress? To the left. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to wear yeah. tiny little... Oh, God, I hope they wear a tiny little police uniform. No, no, no they're going to be, they're gonna be plain heads. clothes. They're yeah, going to be they... plain clothes, otherwise they'll stick out, you know, like a sore thumb. But will they be full, will they be full officers or will they just be, like, community support <laughs> Majestically, this is the news that the Metropolitan Police are considering training eagles to intercept drones. They trialled this in the Netherlands, but they try all sorts of things in the Netherlands. Legalised prostitution, cannabis cafes, showing the Nazis around your attic. Not all of which... <laughs> Not all of which have ended well. <laughs> of course, there are casualties in this line of work, and there's nothing more upsetting for the wife of an eagle than opening the front door to find two sombre and uniform chaffinches saying, <laughs> I'm afraid we've got some very bad news. <laughs> <laughs> he was just about to retire as well. <laughs> <laughs> two days off of his pension. <laughs> Before they tell them, they'll say, I think you, you should perch for this. <laughs> <laughs> the Ministry of Justice reported nine attempts to use drones to infiltrate British prisons last year. And frankly, if you can get one of those up your bottom, you deserve to keep whatever it's going <laughs> uh, Two points to Justin. Steve, who's got involved in one of those classic arguments? Yes, how do we make this exciting? Um... <laughs> Uh, this is the clash of the musical titans uh, in scenes which we probably haven't witnessed since the Britpop wars of the mid-1990s as Classic FM take on BBC Radio 3. <laughs> I know, scintillating, isn't it? I mean, as fights go, that's the big one. It's the heavyweight fights, isn't it? Well, it's, Radio 3 are in a terrible uh, situation. Really. It's very hard to win if you're Radio 3 because, uh, on the one hand, you do your job properly, uh, you put out some amazing programmes. I mean, it costs a lot to run as Radio 3, but they do some fantastic stuff. But maybe don't have as many listeners as some people think they should have for the money that's invested in them. So if they try and make it more accessible, then they're accused of dumbing down or copying Classic FM. And not to mention, has anyone here looked at a BBC Radio 3 message board? <laughs> I cannot believe the station is now too casual and chatty. <gasps> I mean, accusations like this are going to do nothing for the BBC. So there's been an ongoing um, backwards and forwards spat as well between Classic and uh, BBC Radio 3. Someone from, uh, I think, Radio 3 has said something like, Classic FM is a radio station put together by a computer. Uh, suggesting that obviously it doesn't have... Jesus, I can't wait to make a knowledge. film out of this one. God. <laughs> I think what they should probably do to save some money, and, and this is going to not endear me to the Radio 4 probably, is I think Radio 4 can get quite a bit dull with just its speaking. You know, it doesn't have a lot of music on it. So if you cross Radio 3 with 4 and make it Radio 3 quarters and underscore the entire output, you know, the Today programme, when it's a series story, is a bit of Beethoven. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know <laughs> if that is Beethoven. Not Beethoven. <laughs> on um, Desert Island Discs, apparently if you're on Desert Island Discs, you have to choose one classical tune. Not that I've never been on it. Do you know what, I, you know what I found out? There's no island. It's all made up. <laughs> So, on this island, what were you? There's no island. Stop <laughs> lying to people, Kirsty. They're not, ne they're never going to get to. It's like the dragons, then. They're not dragons, they're venture capitalists. <laughs> and dragons don't have dens, dragons have lairs. <laughs> I don't mind classical music, but I don't dance in public, Miles, because I don't have the dance within me. But I enjoy dancing, but I enjoy dancing in the privacy of my own. But your home. ambition, one of your. is to be on Strictly be so on... I can learn the dance. You think that's the sort of unpressurised environment in which to learn yes. to dance? <laughs> and the problem is that Classic FM or BBC Radio 3 are not good to dance to because when I dance, Miles, when I 
Dance. Regrettably, I can picture it, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you really oh, dance? Just, is there like, a knock at the door from the people downstairs like going, this is... <laughs> Take your sodding clogs off. Sexuality, sweat, it's just like, you'd look at it and go, my God, what is that? I can't describe it. It's so many things. It's popping in my brain. It is and local just... property prices plummeting. <laughs> <laughs> Revoltingly, this is the spat, and I hesitate to describe it as such, but I really do feel I must, between Radio 3 and Classic FM, who are engaged in a battle for supremacy over the world. Uh, sorry, over the world of classical music. <laughs> Radio 3 staff have accused Classic FM of being put together by a computer, as opposed to all the BBC stations, which are put together by exhausted, talented people struggling under the weight of their impossibly bloated and yet apparently necessary management. (laughs) (laughs) Recently, Radio 3 introduced a Classic FM-style phone-in, causing listeners to complain of dumbing down and insist they go back to the old request process of liveried heralds barging into the studio, proclaiming their liege's will to a constantly jumpy Katie Durham. Two points to Steve. Now, we're going to do something a bit different from this last question. Uh, as we're in Bristol, this is a quick-fire round for yep. stories with a local interest. And uh, I used to ask those words incredibly loosely. So, <laughs> if everybody's ready, let's play the Brizzle Quizzle. OK. Who's made a wallaby line for freedom? Anyone? Yes, um... Calman. The uh, Calman at uh, Glasgow University. I, uh, <laughs> uh, in what is undoubtedly the biggest story of uh, the week, a wallaby escaped from somewhere and six people in a blanket found it in a park and chased it round and caught it. <laughs> well done, Bristol. Well done. I always think of a wallaby as something that aspires to be a kangaroo but never quite makes it. <laughs> the owner turned up, didn't he? Just, uh, just as uh, the wallaby was being caught, the owner turned up and said... I've been looking for that since Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's a pair of glasses put down. <laughs> yeah. Unnecessarily, this is the story of a wallaby that escaped from its owner's garden after a fence was blown down by Storm Imogen. The RSPCA were called to assist with the rescue of what was described as a privately owned wallaby, because if the Conservatives have taught us anything, it's that these things simply cannot be left in state hands. <laughs> After watching recent attempts in Skegness to rescue beached whales, residents spent hours frantically attempting to coax the wallaby back into the sea. (laughs) A rescue attempt which proved disastrously successful. (laughs) Who's been given the honour of being called Your Honour? Oh, yes. Oh, Calman, Glasgow. Anna Midgley, who's 33, is a a lawyer practising in Bristol, has been appointed Britain's youngest judge. A criminal law judge, not only has she been appointed a judge at 33, she sings in a choir, competes in triathlon. She's specifically designed, I suspect, to make my parents more disappointed. In- <laughs> and she's tall as well, so well done, Anna Mitchley. Oh, crikey. Um- Yes, unequivocally, this is Anna Midgley, a lawyer who practices in Bristol who has become Britain's youngest judge. She was educated at a private school in Exeter before going on to study at Cambridge. Well, everyone loves an underdog. (laughs) She's been appointed to the position of Crown Court Recorder, which is the first step on the career ladder before County Chamber Clarinet. And (laughs) then the crowning achievement of any legal career, Lord Chief Justice Bassoon. (laughs) Okay, fingers on just buzzers that we haven't even brought with us. Um, why could picking leave you out of pocket? Oh, Lamac, Colchester United. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is. I mean, I don't like. This seems ridiculous to me, but it's Bristol City Council, isn't it? Uh, it's one of their new bylaws, and there's loads of new bylaws that they're uh, considering at the moment. But one is that you won't be able to pick. Is it part or whole of a tree or a shrub? A tree? How can you pick a whole tree? Anyway, you're not allowed to take part, whole or part of a shrub. So what, basically what people are saying is, well, that means we can't go fruit picking, we can't pick blackberries. This looks very much to me, people of Bristol, the Bristol City Council have very late and rather ill-advisedly tried to bring in a law to prevent scrumping. <laughs> 
Tragicomically, this is the news that Bristol City Council plan to introduce new rules to their parks, banning people from removing the whole or any part of any plant, shrub or tree. It's been suggested that this could criminalise blackberry pickers. Shocking news that has caused reverberations, if not around the world, than at least as far as Taunton. <laughs> Thank God this sort of thing has not been passed in Devon, where picking a dandelion and blowing on it is still the only reliable way locals have of telling the time. <laughs> Just carrying a little fave with one side of the West Country against the other. <laughs> now, before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they would like to share? I saw one myself that I wanted to bring uh, to the attention of Steve Lamarck, the famous indie DJ and rock god. Uh, two bands performing in Manchester were advertised next to each other, and it was just beautifully uh, serendipitous, uh, that on day one it was the men they couldn't hang and day two was they might be giants. <laughs> Steve. Uh, Dave Dunford saw this on his local uh, WI Facebook group. Uh, Hayfield and District WI, bras for a cause. Just sent off the final batch of bras we have collected. We have collected the grand total of 1,452. Many thanks to everybody who has supported us. <laughs> Susan. This has been sent in uh, by Mervyn Mugford, and it was in the North Devon Journal. I would like to thank the people who stopped their car journey between Instow and Fremington last Saturday, thinking I required medical assistance as I was lying on the pavement outside the house. The reason I was in that prone position is because I was reading the water meter, which is situated deep in the ground. <laughs> Jeremy. Uh, this is sent in by Ivor Hunt. Found. Anybody lost a small key on Gordon Street? Looks like one to a lock, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, and now let's take a look at the final score. Jeremy and Justin have nine, but Steve and Susan have eight. And before we leave you, here is a notice sent in by Robert Jones, taken from the Nuffield Gym Notice Board in Cambridge. Vinyasa Flow Yoga Masterclass. A class for all levels, it will build up your core temperature and work all your muscles. Flow Yoga allows you to connect with your inner child. Please note the class is not suitable for pregnant women. <laughs> and with that from Bristol, goodbye. <laughs> Taking part in the news quiz were Jeremy Hart, Justin Morehouse, Steve Lemack and Susan Cullen. In the chair was Miles Jupp and the news was read by me, Zeb Soames. The chair script was written by James Buck, Max Davis and James Kettle, with additional material by Sarah Campbell and Rebecca Chan. The producer was Richard Morris and it was a BBC Radio comedy production.